detoxing your home, how to check for toxins in your home, and also how to replace them with less toxic, safer alternatives. So we're going to talk about what the problem of toxins is. Why does this matter? How do, how do these toxins impact MS? Where can you find these toxins in your home and how can you choose safer alternatives? And I'm actually going to give you a tour through the environmental working groups website. So you know how to use it so that you can start making different decisions about the products that you bring into your home. So I wanted to bring attention to this idea that actually man-made chemicals make modern life possible. So for example, all of the modern conveniences, the beautiful homes and kitchens and furniture that we have, our dinnerware, um, our bedding, all of these things are the, the product of man-made compounds that were created to build these materials that are enduring, long lasting, they work well. I mean, these are not all natural materials, right? Like what in this picture is a natural material other than maybe the food, right? Even down to the clothing, right? They're not wearing like 100% organic cotton clothing that's pure cotton, right? So man-made chemicals permeate our everyday living, our homes, at the spaces that we live in, work in. And I want to bring attention to this idea that we should be careful about what we choose to bring into our homes, because that actually has an impact on health. So what is this problem of man-made toxins? I always talk about it as the big elephant in the room. It's such a big problem, and it has such an actually significant impact on human health that it's actually too big to wrap your head around. So these compounds that are made by scientists, chemists, uh, have long half-lives. They hang out for a long time. Otherwise, your TV would disintegrate after a while, right? After maybe a few years. But you know, I, you may have a TV that you even grew up with. It still looks like a TV. Maybe it won't work as well, but the materials are still there. So they don't really degrade or they're definitely not going to biodegrade because they're not natural materials. Uh, they off-gas. This is an important concept to think about. The best way I can tell you what off-gassing is, is when you get into a new car and you go, oh, it has that new car smell. Or you get a new shower curtain and go, oh, I can smell the shower curtain. Yes, you can smell it because it's off-gassing. The molecules that are in that product are coming off into the air and you're breathing them in and you are able to detect uh, those scent molecules. So they don't stay put in the TV, in the couch. They are floating around in the environment of your home, most of them are invisible. They don't have a scent, so they go unnoticed. There's a synergistic effect between different compounds. So while one compound may have an effect of, let's say, one, and another compound may also have an effect of one, you add those two up, you would think one plus one is two. But when it comes to many different compounds interacting with each other, it's synergistic. One, one plus one is no longer two, it's four, it's five. So the impact starts magnifying. And you don't have to have a big dose of an exposure to have a health issue or a health outcome from it. Oftentimes it's minute amounts, minuscule amounts of many different toxins that start interacting with each other and they um, start creating uh, problems in the body. Uh, they may start clogging up the liver or having endocrine hormone effects. Um, so this is where the impact on human health comes in. Um, th these molecules actually can interact with our physiology. And there's this concept of endocrine disruption where human hormones can actually get disrupted when, for example, we use plastics and we get BPA into our bodies. Uh, the BPA may bind an estrogen receptor and turn on the estrogen receptor. And now you have an estrogenic effect in the, your body. And for some person, it might turn into a hormone sensitive cancer. In another person, it might be um, infertility, repeated miscarriages. In another person, um, it might be obesity, you know, uh, BPA found in plastics can actually work as an obesogen. It can change how our body handles calories. But the thing is that it's hard to predict which molecule 
molecule is going to do what in a particular person. Their effects are so variable. And so it becomes very difficult to study the impact of man-made toxins on human health. But we do have enough data that um, in, that these toxins um, can actually disrupt the immune system, leading to inflammatory or autoimmune conditions. Um, they can disrupt hormone systems, including thyroid. You know, how, why is it so many of our thyroids are going out? Well, the thyroid is a very sensitive gland. It's always surveilling the environment, trying to figure out what it needs to do. How does it need to dial metabolism up or down? So this en concept of endocrine disruption is real. And these man-made toxins are not inert and, and safe and something we can just forget about. We've been pumping out these toxins into our environment probably you know, for, for a couple, a hundred years or more, but it's really been over the last 80 years that every year we are making at least 2000 new compounds that we're putting into all kinds of modern day products, but they it actually requires very little safety testing, even though humans are interacting with these chemical compounds and, um, not, um, not being aware of the effect on health. All right, so let's talk about toxins and MS. You probably have heard that there may be some associations. It's very hard to prove causation, right? If you get exposed to mercury, you're gonna get MS. Well, we just don't have data like that. And that's not really how toxins behave. What we can um, conclude is that there's a lot of correlations and associations. So this was a case control study. It was actually an Italian study where they took about a, maybe 150 people with MS and um, about 750 pe controls, people who did not have MS, and looked at their histories. And what they found was the people that ended up uh, getting diagnosed with MS had exposures to organic solvents, either in the shoe or leather industry. Um, perhaps they were working in a manufacturing plant where they were coming in contact with organic solvents. Their risk of going on to become positive, um, to test positive for MS was significantly higher than people who did not work in these industries. Um, similarly, there's associations with pesticide exposure and heavy metals um, and MS. And you know, there's many, many toxins out there. There are thousands of things that we're coming in contact with, but people who work with these um, toxins and are getting exposed daily um, are at highest risk. And so we want to start thinking about where do these toxins hide and how can we minimize exposures? So this is like a strawberry farm. And I always think about the person that's there working that farm, they're picking up these uh, pesticides every day if it's not an organic farm. They're getting exposed, they're going to their home, they're walking in their house with their shoes, they're taking it into their home, their kids are getting exposed. And so we have to start digging ourselves out of this problem of um, just putting toxins and man-made chemicals into everything without giving a thought to human health. So where can you find toxins? Well. Let me just say that they're really everywhere. Anything that's a man-made product has chemical compounds that can potentially cause problems for human health. But if you're looking in your home, let's start with your medicine cabinet, personal care products, makeup, toothpaste, um, creams and lotions um, for sure can be full of chemical compounds. In fact, there are studies from the Environmental Working Group that say that the average work woman walks out of the house with over 200 chemical compounds on her body. If that sounds unbelievable to you, think about the number of ingredients in your shampoo, conditioner, mascara, lipstick, eyeliner, face cream, sunblock, perfume, right? It adds up real quick. Now, it's not that hard to get to 200. So let's be more mindful of what we're putting on our bodies. Similarly with chemi uh, cleaning products, lots of them have, um, you know, really strong chemicals that are very good at cleaning. You know, you clean your toilet and it's so easy and everything smells fresh and there's all these artificial scents. So cleaning products are another place where a lot of toxins hide. So I want you to also be um, mindful of what you're using to clean your home. And I'm going to give you some um, ideas of what you can use today. 
Furniture. So this beautiful green color is a dye. It's probably not a natural dye. The wood on this chair is probably held together by glues that may be giving off um, uh, formaldehyde. The wood, if it's not solid, again, can um, be problematic as well because it's been pressed together using a process. It's not natural. Uh, the foam in the cushion certainly is part of it. The rug, um, if the walls were painted, you would think about that as well. So building materials are another place where a lot of toxic chemicals hide. And thankfully, there are newer products that are lower VOC. They're not perfect, but they're a higher choice when it comes to creating a living space that's less toxic and more supportive of health. Okay, so a couple other places to think about the air in your home. This is something we interact with 24 seven. What if we could clean up the air in our home to minimize exposures? There's a lot floating around, unfortunately, in the air that we breathe. And then the water in our tap, again, something we are interacting with um, a lot when we're eating and drinking. So these are the places we're gonna focus on today. And I'm gonna give you some ideas to think about how to choose more wisely to minimize the burden of toxins entering your body. Okay, so how do we start choosing safer products? Well, you want to, first of all, know what the material or the ingredients are. Ask if they're not labeled. Call the company. Uh, if it doesn't feel natural, it probably isn't, right? So do your homework and find out what you're getting. Um, use a database to identify what's toxic and what's safer to use. I'm going to show you how to do that by giving you a tour of the environmental working group today. Uh, choose natural ingredients to the extent possible. Is it possible to get your entire house to be um, natural? No, it's not. I try very hard, but there are some things that I just have to give up on and say, okay, I just need to make a reasonable decision and move on. You're not going to um, you know, be able to get things that are perfectly natural. Um, avoiding scents and colors. Those molecules of scent are oftentimes endocrine disruptors, not good for your hormone system. So they get into the body and um, uh, they can get into the brain um, and start disrupting hormone function. Um, and then, you know, when you're buying something that is dyed, um, what was the dye? What did they use? You know, I think a lot about this with kids' toys because kids put everything in their mouth, right? And there are so many beautiful toys out there that are beautiful and colorful, but like, think about it. It comes at a cost, right? That child gets exposed every time they stick that toy in their mouth. Choosing organic when possible, when it comes to personal care products, when it comes to fabrics and even furniture and bedding, and then buying things that are local. You may not be aware that when, for example, furniture or baskets or some other things are imported in from other countries, they may often be fumigated at the border to get rid of unwanted pests, which is important. You don't want to be shuffling um, bugs and these pests all around the globe, but now you're bringing that into your home. So if you buy something that's local, then it hasn't been sprayed, um, whether it's furniture or even food. Um, so think about buying local when, when it comes to choosing something. Uh, and don't take other people's word for it, right? The, the people that answer a phone at a customer service location or salespeople, this is not on their radar, right? I just had somebody tell me that something they, they bought is organic, but it's not labeled organic, and in fact, when I looked at the label, it's actually got a bunch of, um, uh, you know, artificial, you know, fabrics and rayons and polyesters in it. So somebody told them it was organic. It's actually not. So you have to be the one in charge of choosing what's going to work. I thought this was a really interesting picture because we're going to start by talking about more in depth on how to choose personal care products that are less toxic. So look at this picture of the globe. If you live in a country that is not highlighted, then there's very little regulation on what's safe to put into personal care products. Okay. Look at how many other countries are doing a better job than we are here in the United States. 
right? With all the technology and the knowledge and the science that we have, we're still not advocating for human health, right? And there's many reasons for why this happens. I'm sure you've already got a couple of ideas that's popped into your head, but now the onus is on you to protect your health and the health of your family. So here's a list um, of chemicals. This is like 12 different chemicals that should definitely be banned, but they're not, but hopefully we're getting there maybe in the next five to 10 years. So, you know, if some of these words sound familiar to you, you'd want to make sure they're not found in your personal care products, in your furniture. Like for example, formaldehyde, phthalates, you know, these are um, chemical compounds that have a scent to them. They're used in plastics and makeups, um, parabens, PFAs. These are forever chemicals. Uh, they are um, like your non-stick materials in your pants or waterproofing materials for shoes or stain guard um, on couches, you definitely want to avoid these. There's many health outcomes associated with them. So how do we choose safer cleaning products? So I always go to the environmental working group to find out if what I'm already using is toxic. And if it is, I choose something that is safer. So this goes for your all-purpose cleaners, for your bathroom cleaners, soaps, detergents, even bleach. You can actually find bleach that's less toxic and it still actually works. So I want you to start one by one thinking about, okay, I need to replace this product. The next time I choose a product, it's going to be something safer. Choose natural ingredients for cleaning. So vinegar is wonderful. We have gallons and gallons of um, vinegar that we use to make our cleaning products. Um, baking soda is wonderful for many things. When I have mildew that builds up, I use a combination of, you know, first I do the baking soda, let it sit, then add the vinegar and it, it's fine. I don't have to use bleach. People sometimes use alcohol to clean um, uh, eat many things. You can, you know, you wipe things down. Uh, I even had a patient once tell me that she uses vodka diluted to clean her produce when she brings them home. So um, otherwise, you know, you want to start thinking about non-toxic soaps, essential oils, et cetera. And always choose unscented because again, those scent molecules are problematic. They're toxins. Um, you know, you don't really need that artificial pine scent, right? Um, if I'm gonna show you how to make your own. So um, also choosing organic whenever possible. So um, I'm gonna show you how to do a DIY all-purpose cleaner. This is what I use in my house. Um, basically you can go online and buy a set of you know three uh, spray bottles. I like the glass because I just try to minimize plastic. 50-50 um, mix of water and vinegar. Just throw it into the bottle. Um, if you have uh, surfaces that are you know delicate, they, maybe they're not sealed and they can't take vinegar, well, first of all, always do a little test spot, but if it can't take vinegar, skip the vinegar, just put all water in there, and then you can add your favorite essential oils and some non-toxic soap, liquid soap. Shake it up, you've got an all-purpose cleaner. I use this for our tables, kitchen counters, toilets, showers, everything, right? In fact, a lot of my surfaces can't take vinegar, so I just use the water with the, with this, uh, the soap. Sometimes I'm actually even in too much of a hurry to add in the essential oils, but you could add in lemon um, essential oils or lavender or tea tree oil. Tea tree has uh, antimicrobial properties. So this is pennies, right? We are marketed to, to think that we need a separate cleaner for our toilet, one for the bathtub, one for the sink. You don't. This works for everything. You just got to keep up with it. I have spray bottles throughout the house and we just clean as we go. And I have three boys. So I'm pretty sure that my house gets some, you know, real, real dirt and, and stuff. So if it works for us, I think it works for most other people. Let's talk about furniture. How do you know your furniture is toxic? And before you all panic about what you already own and use at home, um, it's Okay you know, if you're going to replace it, you're going to think about how to get something that's safer, less toxic. So um, the foam and the cushions um, can degrade and oftentimes it's treated with fire retardants. So all of those molecules can get into your home. We've now worked towards banning fire retardants on furniture and hopefully even kids' pajamas and cribs. 
um, uh, uh, looking at the wood, you know, if it's not solid wood, it might be particle board or something else that's sort of been put together through an, a, a process that's not natural. So it's got other chemicals in it. Uh, formaldehyde glues, like think about how this furniture is put together. You know, this could be your table, your bed. Um, are there flame retardants that were used? Um, stain guards. Some of us have paid extra to get the stain guard. I'm guilty of that. I did that about 15, 20 years ago. And then thinking about what's the paint, the varnish that's on this product, because those things off gas. So how do we pick non-toxic furniture? So choosing natural products like cotton, hemp, um, rubber, which is latex, that's a natural product. It's actually, we now have couches that are non-toxic that are made up of um, a, a rubber core, a latex core instead of foam. Um, and uh, also uh, fat, uh, mattresses with, with uh, latex inside. And they're actually quite comfortable. Some of my favorite mattresses all have latex and wool um, wrapped up and then covered with organic cotton Wool is wonderful. Solid wood is great. Now, solid wood, wood is expensive. I actually put this example here. Um, this is, you know, finding a, a cutting board that's one piece of solid wood is really, really hard. Otherwise, if you're using one with multiple pieces put together, it's going to have, you know, have glues in there and then you're preparing food. So that can get into your food. So I love this one. I actually own one of these. Um, so that's, you know, I don't buy a lot of things, but I buy a few things that are I'm happy with that are non-toxic that'll last for a really long time. So choosing organic materials when possible, um, avoiding dyes. You know, sometimes I'll think about like, do I want the one with the dye or can I just get the undyed one? Uh, undyed ones actually look really natural and beautiful. So um, asking questions about what kind of dyes are used is important low VOC, like if I can smell a piece of furniture, I'm not going to buy it. Uh, you can actually look for a, um, a piece of furniture that hasn't been treated with frame retardants. You would look for uh, TB 117 2013. And um, in California, at least that's what you, is used. Um, no stain guards. So I buy things that are not water repellent, like for example, kids lunch bags. Um, Yes, they get, you know, trashed because of food and things spill, but I make sure they're washable or, um, you know, our mattresses have washable covers. Our pillow pillows have removable pillow covers, so we can just wash everything and, and, re and not have to rely on a stain guard. Same, same thing with couches. And then you can look at FSC certification that just tells you that this company has done a good job of working with. Uh, wood that comes from a forest that's being well taken care of. Um, you know, it's important to make sure that the, you know, we support processes that are sustainable. Let's talk about air. Um, so when we're breathing air, there's many things in the air. It could be dust, pet dander, all of the material that's off gassed from your furniture. Um, certainly a lot of us react to pollen and mold. You know, you may be turning on your gas stove and that's a chemical that's getting into the air. Uh, and then, you know, here, all of us on the West Coast and well, not even the West Coast anymore throughout the country, um, wildfire smoke is a big deal, right? And these are very small particles that easily bypass the nose and get into the respiratory system and blood. So we want to clean up the air that we breathe. Um, hopefully you're familiar with what the AQI is, Air Quality Index. You can start watching this number. It's actually fascinating. My kids ask me like, what's the AQI today? You know, it's like one fun metric that we like to follow. So if you use your map um, application for navigation on your phone. Sometimes it's like in the bottom right-hand corner, I think for iPhones, it'll tell you for the for your current location what the AQI is. But I actually tend to use these websites. And actually just a few days ago when we had a lot of drift smoke, I actually use all three websites because they each have their own algorithm to pop out what the AQI is. And so, you know, Purple Air tends to overestimate a little bit. Um, the airnow.gov is by the EPA. So I kind of like look at the three numbers and kind of try to average it out.
And this is what the AQI number means to you. It's a scale. So and if your AQI is zero to 50, great. Everything is good. Uh, 51 to 100, it's you know starting to become problematic. If you are a sensitive person, you have health issues, asthma, you need to be really careful. Perhaps you stay in and hang out by your air purifier. And then, you know, 100, 101 to 150, this is where our soccer practices start getting canceled. And then, you know, you can get in much above that. I do remember back in 2020, August, when we had really severe wildfires, I did remember waking up in the morning, walking into a room and seeing smoke and my AQI monitor said 500 something, right? And it wasn't enough to wake us up. So we were breathing it throughout the night and only realized that in the morning when we woke up and saw the number. So there are AQI monitors for home use, uh, but you don't have to have one. Uh, I would prioritize getting a really good air filter, but it'll change your behavior once you see how this number changes based on what you're doing in the home, like cooking, or you've forgotten to open your windows. And so um, it helps shape our behavior in a way that's moving towards greater health. And you're more aware of what's going on. It helps make the invisible visible. That's why I like monitors like this. So many of you may have central air filters. Um, please make sure that you're using, um, you understand the MERV rating. So you would want to use the highest MERV rating that your system will accommodate. A minimum MERV rating of 10, 13 to 16 would be ideal. The higher the number, the better. You want to make sure you're cleaning them monthly. So you got to figure out how you clean this thing. And then you probably want to replace it every three months. So some of you might right now be thinking, oh, I've never really changed mine. <laughs> That's okay. You can start doing that now. Um, and, you know, if there is a fan that you could also turn on to operate it, it'll actually pull out more particles from the air. It'll work more eff efficiently. Now, for those of us who want to have to really drill down on clean air, I would highly recommend you invest in a really good quality air filter. The air in your home is what you're breathing 24 seven and we're constantly interacting with the molecule, molecules and particles. So especially with, if you live in an area where wildfires are common, I would highly recommend that you, um, you know, budget for this. Um, so you're gonna look for a true HEPA filter. There are a lot of air filters out there that aren't real true HEPA filters. They're not gonna do you any good. It's a complete waste of money. You wanna have a good filter that's actually gonna take the particles out of the air so that you don't breathe them in. Run it daily, not just when there's wildfires. There's a lot floating around that you can't detect. And so the more of these man-made chemical compounds that are off-gassing in your home that you breathe, the bigger the load on your liver to deal with these molecules. So I run mine at a low level all day long. Um, get one that's quiet so that you don't have this added noise in your house. Replace your filters regularly. It's no good if the filters are clogged up. If you only have one and you can't move it, I'd stick it in the bedroom because that's hopefully where you're spending eight to nine hours. There are many that are smaller that you can move. So if you want to just buy one, you put it during the day in your living space and then you take it to the bedroom at night. Um, and by the way, uh, I should just say this is IQ Air. Um, this is what I own. Um, I, this, this is an incredible piece of machinery. It is, uh, and I'll show you why in a second, but, um, it has wheels. You can move it room to room. I've got one and I move it. Um, and, uh, we actually, um, offer this through the shop on our website. Um, and you get a, a small discount by buying it there and helping our scholarship program. But, um, this is one of the best filters money can buy. Okay, so this I wanted to put this slide up to show you what particle sizes look like and what we're trying to achieve with an air filter. So human hair is about um, 70 microns. So that's that's about the size like of a human hair. Mold, pollen, they're somewhere on the order of, you know, um, 
maybe maybe a lot of you know two and a half to ten. Uh, these are called coarse particles. Most air filters can basically take you down to 0.3 microns. Okay, so they'll take anything that's 0.3 microns or bigger. Okay, so they are not doing a good job of allergens, dust mites, pet dander, tobacco smoke, wildfire smoke, which is oftentimes much smaller than 0.3 microns. So this is why I chose the IQ Air because it'll deal with all of these really ultra fine particles right? Um, I feel like it's money well spent and it's such an important um, factor in just promoting a healthy home. All right, so let's move on to water. So unfortunately, our tap water, even though it's regulated, it still has toxic chemicals in there. There's pharmaceutical agents that are in there, um, heavy metals, etc. So people say, I'm gonna go buy bottled water. Well, bottled water probably is less regulated. It's very expensive. I think there are estimations that it costs 2000 times the price of uh, tap water and it's sitting in plastic. So that plastic is getting into the water that you're drinking. So it's a great way to introduce microplastics into your body, right? The best option is to take your own um, tap water and filter it and buy the best filter you can afford. So I'm going to show you how to do that today using the EWG's web uh, database, which is also going to show you actually what's in your um, tap, uh, in your um, district's water report. So here are some water filter comparisons. Here on top, you have an activated carbon like those pitcher filters, reverse osmosis, and ion exchange. These are just three different ones that are being compared. Um, look at all the different contaminants, for example. Ion exchange does not take out very many. The pitcher filters actually does a pretty good job, but it's not as comprehensive as reverse osmosis. And this is just, you know, a, a dozen toxins. It's not all of the toxins that are out there. So the highest choice actually is reverse osmosis. If that's not possible for you, then I would go with an activated carbon. Okay, so let's talk about reverse osmosis. You would want to buy this filter to use for your cooking and drinking water. Okay, you're not gonna do a whole house reverse osmosis. They exist, but they're extremely wasteful and unnecessary and expensive. So the pros are that you're gonna get the most number of contaminants removed. The cons are that it's gonna remove minerals. So you can add on a $25 remineralization filter to put calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium back in. You do have to drill into your countertop, although I do know of one product that's a countertop version where there is no drilling. I actually own it and it's one of my favorites. Um, so um, it's called, it's by a company called APEC, a PEC countertop reverse osmosis. That one does not require dr drilling. So if you are renting or you're going to be moving, then you know you may want to opt for something that is not permanently installed. There is water wasted. So perhaps for every one gallon of clean water that you're getting, you may be wasting somewhere between one and a half to four gallons of water. So if that's important to you, I mean, it should be important to all of us, um, when you're buying a reverse osmosis filter, look at the uh, wastewater ratio. And then uh, with most reverse osmosis um, filters, once the water gets filtered, it's a slow process. That water is being pushed across a membrane and the, the, thing, the water goes through and everything else stays behind. Um, then the water is stored in a tank that's lined with a rubber material. I'm not too keen on that. Um, you know, they say it's food grade. I'd rather just not deal with it. So I, there are tankless reverse osmosis um, filters where the water that comes out of the spout after it's uh, filtered, you need to catch it into your own container. So I have giant glass containers with a spigot. Um, that's how I store my water. And it's not that hard. It's in, and now I'm confident that my water is as clean as it can be. Um, activated carbon filters. This is like your pitcher. 
Um, again, using this for just cooking and drinking. Um, the pros are that it for for what these cost. You know the um, pure P U R. They you know they cost maybe about thirty to forty dollars for the pitcher. It comes with a filter, and the replacement filters are maybe ten fifteen dollars each. So they they actually do a pretty good job of removing a good number of contaminants. They're portable. When we camp. I don't have access to reverse osmosis filtration. I take my pure filter um, and uh, it, um, you know, it, it unlike uh, reverse osmosis, it doesn't remove minerals. So you don't have to worry about giving the minerals back. Um, the cons are your water, once it goes through the filter, it gets into the plastic pitcher. So I just have a different container. I just put the filter part right on top of my stainless steel container when I'm camping and I catch the water in that and that's how we do it. Okay, so now the fun part, we're gonna do a tour through the EWG so that you can get good at using this website. I find this website could actually be a little more intuitive. So, um, so I'm gonna take you through it to show you how you can start um, using it. Okay, so let's see, let's start here. Okay, so when you go to ewg.org, you're gonna go to their consumer guides right up here and hopefully you all see this. And all these boxes are just great information that we should all know. So this is where we're gonna look for our water report and what filter is gonna best work for us. Um, I'll get there in a second. This box here is EWG verified. So for personal care products, these products in here are meet the highest standards. So you don't, you just, you know, it's the best you can do. So this is personal care products. Um, you can come down here for sunscreens. Somebody asked me for sunscreen yesterday. So you can come in here and learn about what kind of sunscreen and um, and it'll give you products that are non-toxic. And then if you scroll down, there's, you know, a lot of great information. All, all of their consumer guides are down here. Okay, so let me take you into this box, Skin Deep. This is where we're gonna need um, a little audience participation. Uh, is there someone who wants to tell me the name of a product that they use? You could put it in the chat um, or you could say it out loud um, and then I'll check it for you. So maybe this is a personal care product. Maybe it's your toothpaste, um, makeup. Um, if nobody chimes in, I know what I'm going to pick. Oh, okay, native. What is that? Let's see here. So not, not everything is in their database. So if, if your product is not in their database, you can actually take each ingredient, type that in here instead and find out what it's... Um, toxicity score is. So anyways, uh, let's just say, okay, so look at this. Uh, oh, these are not native. Let's see. Hmm. It, okay. So for example, for this one, it did not pull up. Uh, oh no. Oh no, it did. Okay. Here we go. Native. This deodorant came up. It's a three, three out of 10. So it's not getting the EWG seal where it's like the best you could do. I generally try to stick to a one or a two. Um, three is not the worst thing, but if it works for you and you're okay with the three, then great. And then what it does is it lists each ingredient and tells you the, the toxicity score on a scale of one to 10 for each ingredient. So there's just one um, ingredient that's uh, you know a five in this. So this is not a terrible product. And deodorant is a hard one because a lot of them are non-toxic, but they don't work or they burn a hole in your armpit. You know, they're just so hard to hard on your skin. Okay, so that's how you use that. Uh, so you would just put your products in here and check its toxicity score. Now let's go on to um, here, tap water database. This, I need somebody's zip code. Go ahead and type it in the chat. I'm going to put in the first one that I see and we're going to get your water report. Okay. Got one. All right. 
So sometimes you'll have multiple water districts that show up. So you have to choose yours to get accurate results for what's coming through your tap. So let's say that this is the correct one here. We're gonna go view utility. And then here, look at this, 15 um, contaminants exceeded EWG's guidelines. So, you know, the government, the EPA has its own standards, but the EWG and many other scientists actually feel like those standards aren't uh, stringent enough. So um, they've come up with their own standards. And so there's 15 that um, exceeded EWG guidelines, and then there's a, a few more that we should think about. So keep scrolling down. Here are the 15, okay? So for example, arsenic is found at 50 time, 58 times um, the, the amount that EWG thinks is safe, okay? So there's a discrepancy between what your water district thinks it's safe versus EWG because they have just, um, you know, higher standards. They're more strict. So then if you wanted to learn more about arsenic, you would click here and, and read about it. So these are your top 15 that were quite high. I mean, look at this one, 711 times EWG's um, safe level. And then um, here are the 15 stated right here. And what they've done is they've taken each um, water filter. I showed you this picture earlier and showed you for which, which filter is going to do the best at taking out the top 15 problematic contaminants in your water? Well, it's reverse osmosis, okay? So it's always going to be reverse osmosis, and the activated carbon is going to be a, a, a close second. So um, if you go further down, and here are the other for the total of 29, um, you can see here um, the reverse osmosis actually does much better than the activated carbon, okay? So that's how you look for your water. And then one other thing I wanted to show you was um, also how to check for cleaning products that are um, that are problematic. So let's see. I have never figured out how to get to this page internally from inside their website, but my my um, my cheat for it is I go to Google and I put in EWG cleaners, EWG cleaners, and then this page comes up. So somebody give me the name of something they use to clean their house. Put that in the chat. I'm going to take the first thing I see. Ah, good one. Okay, method. Who's using method soap? Let me make sure I can spell it. <laughs> method. Okay, here we go. So to actually get an accurate report, you have to actually make sure that you're using the correct products, so get the full name. But just to give you an idea, you know, we think of method as being um, a pretty safe product line. Okay, there is, there's a few that are Bs, Cs, and then it goes on for many pages. So let's go to page four. Ds and Fs. So you can't just trust a brand and think that everything they do is going to be okay just doing that. Let me show you another one. Seventh generation. Let's see how they do. So I, I buy a lot of their products, but I don't just buy them without consulting this database. Okay, great. Look at how many products they have that are A's. Let's go to page four. Okay. Yep, D's and then F's. So you do have to, in order to use this, database, you do really need to actually make sure you're looking at the correct product. Even sometimes when it's like the scent is different, like one's lemon, one's lavender, that could change the score, right? So don't, don't assume. Okay. So I hope that gave you an idea of how you can start um, learning more about um, these products and how to make better choices. Because at the end of the day, it's really about um, having less exposures. The less things we can get exposed to, the better it is 
for our um, immune systems, our livers, like the liver is just looking at molecules and pulling them out and transforming them to get them ready to leave the body, right? So um, the less we can put into the body, the more we just kind of give the liver a break, we offload the liver so that it can do its job more efficiently. You're not gonna be able to get your toxic exposures down to zero, but it will matter if you could cut your exposures maybe by a third, maybe by a half, you know, depending on, you know, what your personal situation is. So let me um, talk to you about some other solutions. You know, this is something we think a lot about um, in our home. Um, it, it's a topic of conversation at work for me with all my patients, with my kids. And so let's see. What if you could improve your MS health by cutting your toxic exposures, right? There are ways to do this. Like today, I gave you so many different ways to choose products um, wisely to, you know, if you're going to buy a, a shampoo, do we really have the right to use toxic shampoos that go down the drain and get into the environment? I would say no. I think it's all actually everybody's responsibility to use the least toxic material that works for them. And so this is a process, right? And the problem of toxins is not going to go away. So we have to start protecting our bodies and we have our detox program coming up. Uh, it starts uh, September 23rd. It goes to October 14th. It's a 12 day MS detox challenge. Now I know these dates are more than 12 days, it's because we give you one week of prep time together before we jump into the 12 days. Um, this is going to be more than just food and detox. There's daily behaviors and routines we're going to have you do to really push detox further. Uh, and people come out feeling good. They feel like their energy is better, mood, anxiety is better, pain is better. I've had people say like, all my pain went away and I actually don't need my pain medicines anymore. I need to call my doctor, right? Um, my uh, walking is better. Balance is better. I'm less anxious. So this is just a quick preview of what can happen when you start putting in good food and good lifestyle behaviors. It has to be a part of every MS care plan. When we all go and see our neurologists, it's not enough to just follow their advice if we truly want to do better, we have to use all of our tools. So this is a really fun program. We usually follow it up with our six-week gut restoration program. It's the, the gut um, the gut health uh, protocol where we do an elimination diet together. And, and um, so it's, it's really fun to do them actually together and they work really well together. But if you're new to this, I highly recommend you start here to see what 12 days can do for you. It's a quick reboot. It's a quick reset.